This is ENP Audio, a service of editor and publisher magazine since 1884, the authoritative voice of news publishing. Welcome back for a new episode of ENP Reports, the official podcast from the staff of editor and publisher magazine. I'm your host, Bob Andelman. This week, Editor-in-Chief Nu Yang talks with journalists from the Greenville News, winners of the 2019 Epi Award for Best Community Service on a media-affiliated website. Investigative reporter Nate Carey and visual journalist Josh Morgan take listeners behind the scenes of their work on Taken, their series on civil asset forfeiture in South Carolina. Nu? Here with me today are Nate Carey, investigative reporter, and Josh Morgan, visual journalist. Thanks for joining me here today, guys. Thanks for having us, and uh, thanks for the uh, award as well. Um, well, first, let's get started on some of the background of the project. Um, what exactly is taken about? Sure. Um, so there's a process called civil asset forfeiture, which uh, allows police uh, and law enforcement agencies to seize um, the assets of, of ill-gotten goods. Um, usually it's related to, uh, to drug dealing. Um, that's what it's intended for. Um, mm -hmm. But through, uh, through the years, there's been a lot of abuse of the system. Um, and, and there really hasn't been a lot um, known about how it works, uh, especially in, in, on a state level like South Carolina. So we wanted to, to uh, look into what, um, how often it's used, um, who profits from it, uh, where the where the assets go once they're seized, um, who it is that's that uh, the assets are being taken from, and whether they are uh, whether they're convicted of a crime. Hmm. Um, and so, how did you guys come into it? Um, was it a tip you guys got? Um, how, so how did the story probably the idea come to you guys to do the series? Sure. So, so there was a team of reporters who ended up working on the project, and, but originally it was just one single story. Um, one of our uh, reporters, uh, Anna Lee, um, was uh, a court reporter and, and, and public, ser public uh, service reporter, and she was looking through court records one day and just saw a case of an individual who was a, a bar had a barber shop in town, um, had had some money that had been seized from him, twenty five thousand dollars had been seized from him that uh, he claimed was um, was money to go purchase another property in, in, for another barber shop in a neighboring town, and, um, and and she started looking at this case and realized he was never uh, they never found any drugs um, on him or in his vehicle or anything like that. They never charged. They never convicted him of any um, any crime, and yet he had to fight for years to try to get his money back, mm -hmm. and in the end had to pay an attorney uh, a decent amount of, of the uh, the money to to get it back um, to fight his case. Um, so she started to uh, to become interested in that single case. Actually, wrote a a story up about it that uh, that we decided once once she found that case, we started looking at others found others in Greenville, um, where we live in the upstate of South Carolina, and then mm -hmm. decided um, to uh, to look across the state and, and really take a, a big picture look at what was going on with this uh, with this law. Wow, so it's just basically one reporter is kind of blitz it, pulling the thread, and all of a sudden just, you know, gets bigger and bigger and bigger, right? Exactly. So. <laughs> yeah, classic um, investigative uh, lead in, in, in that turns into a, turn, turns into a major project. Yeah, so, um, so this, project took two years correct uh, yeah it, it was it was a little over two years including okay. that that portion where she was uh working on that individual case but about two years that we were devoted um to to the project in, in gathering mm -hmm. all of the data and going through it and then uh, connecting all the interviews and finding uh victims and working on videos and visuals to go with it um it, it uh, ended up being a little over two years okay uh, Nate, can you talk a little about some like how much work was involved with the editorial side as far as how much stories was produced? And then Josh, can you talk a little about um, um, the photos and videos and how did that enhance the storytelling, having all these visuals with the story as well? So the, the main thrust of the project was 
to find every single case of, of civil asset forfeitures use in South Carolina. Uh, and we and we looked at a period of three years from 2014 to 2016, mm -hmm. and we found um, about 3,200 um, court records of uh, of times that uh, assets were seized and then forfeited or a forfeiture process was started. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that allowed us to show um, who it was being taken from, um, and, and our findings, uh, one of the key findings was 65% of forfeiture cases involved black men in South Carolina, and black men only make up 13% of the population in South Carolina, um, and that's higher than the incarceration rate or the conviction rate or, or uh, pretty much any other um, any other rate involving black men in the state. So um, that was a surprising key finding. It also mm -hmm. allowed us to show how much um, money, how, 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 who profited from it. So in our state, police and sheriff's offices get the bulk of the money in the end. Interesting. Uh, so there's a built-in incentive um, to seize assets because it's going into your budget in the end. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so that's one of the critical issues that we looked at as well. Uh, we found that in all in those three years, uh, police had seized $17.6 million just in cash. Uh, and, they, and they get to keep it, so that's incentive you're saying. So they get to, yeah. And okay. a lot of times it's in it's in small amounts. So we more more than half of our cases, it was less than two thousand dollars that they seized. Sometimes as as little mm -hmm. as um, as eighteen dollars or thirty six dollars or fifty dollars. So likely just cash that somebody was carrying on them. Mm -hmm. And, and, and by studying all those cases, we also cross checked them to search for uh, criminal uh, court cases as well which showed that um, that uh, a, a lot of these cases, there was no criminal process. We had over mm -hmm. 800 cases where we couldn't find so much as a traffic ticket that was issued. Interesting, but um, they still um, so a lot of times they were process. I'm sorry? I'm sorry, so they still lost a lot of assets even though they go to court, correct? Is that what? Exactly, okay. right. So there's a civil process with these assets that are seized and that's separate from a criminal process but the way our law is structured, the, the whole reason for seizing assets is based upon a belief that they're being used to commit a crime, um, mm. allegedly a drug crime. And, and so you're profiting from this crime, so we're seizing your assets. And that, that we pointed out didn't turn out to be the case in a lot of, in a lot of these uh, instances. And then there were a lot of others, another bulk, about 800 cases where people were charged with some sort of a crime, but they never ended up being convicted of that crime. Mm -hmm. and, and they didn't automatically get their assets back. They had to still mm -hmm. fight separately. And, and many times um, they didn't, uh, weren't able to get their assets back um, for, for a myriad of reasons that mm -hmm. we had to be serious. Mm -hmm. um, how was it like, um, we'll get to you, Josh, in a moment about the original storytelling, but as far as um, getting access to these Victims, individuals, um, were they willing to talk and you know about this? So how was that? What was that like going and getting those people to be able to go on record and talk about their experiences? Sure, and Josh can uh, address this uh, as well. Yeah, Josh, um, like they want the photos. Yeah, like, Josh the photos in the paper. You know, you know, it, yeah. It was difficult to find victims who were willing to talk. So a lot of them. Um, a lot of the cases that we found were years old, um, so maybe wanted to move on, um, or it was difficult to track people down. Um, a lot of other times, we would uh, knock on doors or write letters or uh, emails or Facebook messages and things like that and just get no response. Um, so it was really us, because nobody was bringing this story to us, we were going out trying to find people to talk about their mm -hmm. cases. Um, it became a, a real search to find victims uh, of this who were true victims um, mm -hmm. and, uh, and and would be willing to tell their story because there's a whole issue here of, um, of, of underrepresented minorities um, being taken advantage of by authorities. And so there's a lot of hesitancy to, to discuss it uh, on the record. So a, a real um, a real positive for us we're, we're, we're being able to find those victims who were willing to talk about their case and, and they were brave enough and had courage enough to, to do it on the record and, and tell about what happened to them. Yeah, okay. So um, Josh, so on your, on your side, you know, getting them, getting the visuals, getting photos and, and videos, what was that like talking to these individuals and getting them maybe comfortable enough to, to do that? Yeah, well, um, you know, I think a lot of the sourcing and legwork was was done by the reporting team in, in finding 
our, our victims that we decided to, to feature. And then, um, so Lauren Petrock, another photographer who worked at the Greenville News at the time, and I, uh, we basically went around the state speaking with folks and um, and spending quite a quite a, a few days with them. Um, mm-hmm. The way that I would usually approach it is, um, you know, they knew that they had to do some kind of interview process, and so. I would meet them face to face before uh, before I put any cameras in their face, something like that. Uh, just sit down with them, speak with them, and I would start after that by doing a video interview with them. It usually lasts about an hour, maybe an hour and a half or so. Um, I would uh, I, I'd take a, a list of questions the reporters had for them, and then I would take questions that uh, that I thought would work well for a video format. And then after that, it was really just kind of a go go with the flow sort of situation. Um, I spent several days with uh, with some of our our subjects, um, you know, and just kind of documenting their daily lives. Uh, I would look for for thematic cues, depending on uh, little things here and there that might come out from an interview. But is, there, is, is there an example you can give of what what, what that is? What's a, a thematic cue? Or... Um, you know, like, for example, um, one of our, our victims uh, is this hip-hop artist, uh, Johnny Grant, who's based in Atlanta. He was pulled over in South Carolina. And so he was on his way to perform in, I believe, Charlotte, got pulled over in the Greenville area. Mm-hmm. And so the weekend that I went over there, he was going to perform at this uh, small music festival just outside of Atlanta. Mm-hmm. And so the idea that you know he was pulled over and had his property seized uh, on the way to a show, um, I was able to sort of illustrate that by like spending time with them, driving around through Atlanta on his personal errands. I would match, you know, um, I would match him speaking about that incident driving to Charlotte with like footage that um, that I took of him driving around in his daily life, mm-hmm. him okay. talking about his his her persona and his performances, his career as a rap artist by mixing in. Um, you know, some footage from his show and, and performance that night. Um, and then a, a lot of other stuff just kind of pops up, you know, and people living their daily lives. Uh, I think it's really important to to show the daily life of somebody. Like, for example, with, with Johnny Grant, he spent a lot of that day with his kids. And so we were going around all over the place going to dinner, he was playing basketball with his kids, you know, just spending time dropping off his his young kids before heading out to that show. Mm-hmm. You know, and I think showing showing that human side to this person is really important in in coming away with images and video that can help other or help our audience connect with these people more than just kind of like, oh, this guy is a rapper you know, and he got pulled over. Mm-hmm. Something. I was like, no, this guy's a human being. He has mm-hmm. a family that he's taking care of. This is what, you know, this is what that money meant to him, you know. Um, so sort of that sort of stuff. Oh, great. Okay. So in a way, that adds that, like you said, that a face to the story, correct? So it yeah. makes it more of the connections there for the reader when they get to see it in print and also a video or a photo to kind of connect to that. Okay. Right. Yeah. Um, so what kind of response did you guys receive after Taken was um, published? Um, what kind of impact have you seen in the community? So so uh, we published in uh, beginning in January 28th of this of this year. Um, mm-hmm. and we did and we rolled it out over the course of three weeks. And we did it um, we did it that way because we had so many stories. We had we had six what we called episodes, six main episodes or parts to our series. And then we had about 32, I believe, URLs in all, um, including five different videos and dozens of, uh, of pictures and galleries. But I, I say all that to say the, the first day, the first episode that ran, we had immediate feedback and immediate feedback across the state 
and immediate feedback from legislators, um, which is a, a key uh, audience that we hope to reach um, as we are pointing out issues within our, our system and the law. Um, within a week of, of the initial rollout of the project, um, lawmakers were calling to, for full-scale reform of our system. Um, and, and maybe uh, two or three weeks after, after we launched, um, down, down in Columbia at the State House, they held a, uh, a big press conference and dozens of legislators were in the background as they announced a, a reform bill to completely do away with civil asset forfeiture and replace it with a system of criminal forfeiture based on conviction of a crime. Um, so that that initial uh, bill had a hundred and something of our 124 uh, House members had signed on to this bill, saying we we you know, we want to be a part of this as well. That that bill ended up getting stalled in in the House um, in, in at the end of the session. It was more an aspect of um, they were trying to shoehorn a bill from another state that had some language in it that didn't fit with our state's court system and language. And so they need to step back and, and um, they, they created a study committee that, that actually just met again uh, Tuesday, um, this past Tuesday. And, and they've been meeting off and on to craft the right language for reform bill. So there, there should be another bill that's introduced um, in the January session when our legislature goes back uh, into session. And, uh, and we're, we're, we've been told um, that that they, they expect to pass something at least out of the House. And then, of course, there's a Senate involved in, in the governor's signature. So we'll, uh, we'll see where the reform ends up. But there's been tremendous mm -hmm. public support for uh, reform. There was tremendous outrage uh, at, at this system and the stories that we were able to uncover. Um, and and um, so we'll see. Uh, we'll see where it ends up. Um, is that kind of like what's next for you guys then again kind of following this bill um and yeah. see where it goes from here right we've been we've been following uh developments within uh within asset forfeiture um for for this whole year i think i've written 12 or 13 other stories uh, throughout mm -hmm. the year just as follow-ups and process and and what's next um and as, as an aside there was a u.s supreme court case mm -hmm. that um was decided back in february that also affects um what's going on in south carolina and in that case, um, it was called Tyson Timms versus Indiana. Um, the the entire not, uh, Supreme Court um, agreed that the excessive that that fines and forfeitures could be considered excessive, and mm -hmm. um, and so that's going to lead to more um, decisions and court decisions um, across the country um, in, in the coming years as mm -hmm. other states grapple with their system of asset forfeiture and whether it, it is excessive, um, like the uh, Supreme Court found. So as part of that, just recently we had a, uh, we had a court decision in South Carolina that said that, that we need to tackle this. It, the, the judge said our system is unconstitutional in South Carolina. Mm -hmm. It needs to be reformed. Mm -hmm. So that, that's another layer of pressure on, on the legislature to, uh, to pass this bill. Okay, interesting. I, I, I mean, I guess it's safe to say like none of this sort of happened if you guys didn't do your taking series. Would that be correct in saying that, or <laughs> having just kind of <laughs> like all this work and this bill? It's kind of like um, all because of this, like you're saying, the watchdog is going with them. Um, so, can you talk about, about why it's so important to have this, you know, investigative journalism continue in these newsrooms with you know limited resources? less people, you know, setting, setting Josh to Atlanta, even that for some newsroom is an expense they can't afford. So, um, so you can talk a bit about, about why this kind of um, work is so important for newsrooms today. Yeah, let, let me talk about that first and then I'll turn to Josh to talk about like the commitment that you had uh, and, and the time commitment and, and developing the, the videos to go with it and stuff. Um, mm -hmm. As far as the importance of the journalism, you're, you're right that without this package of stories, nothing would have happened in South Carolina. Um, mm -hmm. There had been stories done before. Um, there had been series done before by other outlets in the state and that, that helped to, to propel this forward a little bit. Um, and, and there had been um, talk about the problems with the law in the past. A lawmaker here and there would file a bill to reform it, but it would never go anywhere. Um, mm -hmm. It was really until we had, until we could, could show here are the victims, here are the stories. Like this is the, a specific example of somebody, some old widow who almost lost her house 
because mm -hmm. some police uh, agency wanted to seize it because somebody had made a drug deal out in her yard. Uh, and we were able to show there's actual victims to this process and the system is built um, that that is not advantageous to these victims to to keep their right to their own property. Um, nothing was going to happen. And, and, and we've been told by by some advocates for reform that without pointing out um, the entire state and and going through all of these cases and being able to document it and show the numbers which were which were not available, mm -hmm. um, that nothing probably would have happened. Um, and, and so that was that was key. And, and that's what took that investment of time. We spent almost an entire first year of this project was just gathering data and going. We had to go to about half the courthouses in the state one by one and sit down and take pictures of records. And there were a lot of them weren't electronically available. It's not the, um, the glamorous side of journalism, but it had to be done, right? So. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so so that commitment and that and that's what's important about uh, a full time investigative uh, journalism and the commitment uh, to to mm -hmm. fund that, and then the commitment that we that we need from the community that to want that um, mm -hmm. to to be able to right wrongs or, or, or show unjust situations and point out things that that should be changed. Um, and, and then as part of that, like there's this, there's a huge commitment on, on our visual journalist sides um, of of the time and, and that it takes to uh, to document that beyond. Um, just the to, to move it beyond just the data. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm sure jo for Josh, I know you, you had probably had to go back and like edit it, put it together, you know, produce it. Was that part of your work process as well? Yeah. Um, so I, I'd say like all in all, um, the process of gathering the footage, which you know, really important. We wanted to make sure that we had a visual representation of a, a diverse group of victims. Uh, and, but also speak to speak to people who are familiar with the with the situation. We we interviewed uh, the Spartanburg County Sheriff Chuck Wright. Um, followed along uh, Operation Rolling Thunder, which is kind of like this organized um, event where they they make a lot of these these stops on the highway on on, on Interstate 85. Um, and it wasn't just to you know gather as much as we can anything and any, everything that's related. It, it was at the end of the day, I think um, what the visuals represent is the same thing that the the entire investigation of stories represent. Um, mm -hmm. You know, putting the video together, you can watch that, understand what the problem is, see what the scope of it sort of is, and then, and then see who the, the, the players are and see who the people affected by it are. And, you know, one thing that really struck me about, um, about the feedback to this is we had this sort of like, um, I don't know, email that, that taken, uh, people could reach out to us through email with, with tips or to share their own stories. And we had a lot of people share their own stories about going through similar processes mm -hmm. and, you know, a lot of a lot of what I think about visual journalism, it, it's 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 more than just kind of like showing the face of of the victim or something like that. You know, um, I try to accomplish more than just kind of going out there, taking a portrait, and then and then leaving. It's it's really it's really showing people as people. And I think what that can do for an audience who engages with visual journalism is able to see a set of images that tell a complete story, to see videos that tell a complete story. Um, you know, it, it, can, it has the power to show people in a really easy, intuitive way. You know, if you're going through or you have gone through a similar situation where you're pulled over and you had your money seized, you know, it's it's powerful to look at people who have also gone through that and to realize I'm not alone. This is happening to other people also. I can see this happening to other people right in front of me. Yeah. Um, and so that time commitment just to be able to flesh out those visual stories uh, and to bring more empathy 
and uh, humanity to the visual storytelling aspect is, I think, really critical, um, especially, you know, when the investigation is long, mm-hmm. a lot of stories to go through, there's a lot of text to go through. Um, you know, I, I think that at, at least I, I, I'd hope that, like, my visuals are sort of like the heartbeat, right? So it's like, that's like the the cadence that you're just kind of like going through. Here's some here's some text, here's some visuals to look at, here's some text, here's some visuals to look at. And constantly, you know, having those connections is like who I'm reading about is who I'm also seeing, you know. That's true. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, congratulations again on your FBA award. Uh, where can people find Taken if they want to read more about it? Sure. You can, you can find it at uh, greenvillenews.com. Um, and we have a uh, we have a tab uh, called Take an Investigation, and, and there's actually a table of contents there, and you can read through every story that we've published, and, and then all of the follow-ups as well. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention my my the entire team um, that that worked on this project as well. So, yeah. um, so there was a team of three um, three uh, reporters, um, Anna Lee, Mike Ellis, and myself, and then there were two visual journalists, Josh uh, Morgan here and uh, Lauren Petraka. Um, who, who each contributed um, visuals for the project, and then we had a uh, we had an editor. And this is a little intriguing part about um, about how this all came together. Our editor was based in Stanton, Virginia, and mm-hmm. we're part of the USA Today network, so we were able to tap into um, people with experience in investigations and, and leading investigations and and putting them all together um, as a package across the network. So uh, William Ramsey in, in Stanton, Virginia. And then we had a data uh, reporter, uh, Mike McGlone, in uh, in Asheville, North Carolina, who also helped us uh, crunch some of the numbers and and tease out some of the statistics that we needed. And then uh, an entire design and storytelling team um, in uh, at USA Today, and that they're across the country, that helped put together the package and the design elements for uh, for our digital um, digital production, then also in print. Um, so I, I think there was like 16 people that, uh, wow. that yeah. contributed. That really shows the, the power of uh, collaboration too, news and collaboration and, and working together for, for the story and for the series. So that's great. Thank you, New. That wraps up this week's edition of ENP Reports, the official podcast of Editor and Publisher Magazine. We hope you've enjoyed the show. Please subscribe in YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you watch and listen to your favorite podcasts. And if you'd like to rate and review the show, well, we'd appreciate that too. This is your host, Bob Adelman, saying thanks for watching, thanks for listening. Please consider checking out my other podcast, Mr. Media Interviews, now in its 13th year at mrmedia.com. That's mrmedia.com. Let's talk, edit, and publish again next week. This is ENP Audio, a service of editor and publisher magazine since 1884, the authoritative voice of news publishing.